Ever since we did the episodes, What Kind of Karate is in Cobra Kai, we've been getting requests from viewers to cover all sorts of movies. So, we've decided it might be fun to look at some martial arts cinema trivia, and to start off with, it just seemed appropriate to start with my personal favorite, The Karate Kid. I would also like to extend a great big thank you to one of our viewers, Nick Pierce, for contributing some of the trivia on this list. So, grab your popcorn and red leather jacket and let's get started. Now we watched as the unsuspecting Daniel LaRusso did a myriad of chores in Miyagi's garden and it appeared as slave labor, only to reveal that the karate master was teaching Daniel some hidden defense techniques. It was a turning point in one of the most memorable moments in the film. We also see him teach Daniel techniques on balance and punching. However, we never see Miyagi teach him any kicks. Sure, Daniel imitates the crane kick on the beach stump, but we aren't privy to any of the kicking techniques that Miyagi teaches him, ever, in any of the three films. The filmmakers had to receive special permission from DC Comics in order to use the title The Karate Kid. The Karate Kid was originally a short-run comic book series featuring a man by the name of Val Armour, the son of a Japanese crime lord and superhero in which he has managed to master every single form of martial arts in history up through the 31st century. I'd like to see the Cobras try to take him out of commission. The comic enjoyed a short run from 1976 to 1978, and even though it's had some recent reboots, it never could match the popularity of the film. Daniel wears the same pair of shoes throughout the entire film. Now this one seems like a small detail, but to me it shows a great attention the filmmakers put into the character. He did not grow up with the money or affluence or the privilege of the other students in the valley, so it manifested in his limited wardrobe. The Cobra Kai Dojo was actually a functioning dojo when they filmed the movie. It was filmed at Jung Chong's Taekwondo in North Hollywood, California. Now this explains a lot of the photos on the wall and some of the decor. The same dojo was also featured in the film Say Anything starring John Cusack. Oh, and you see this little green fence? Yeah, it's gone in part three. Coca-Cola owned Columbia Pictures at the time filming took place. So obviously they wanted their products showcased whenever possible. This would explain references to Minute Maid as well as a bunch of soda. Now, Ralph Macchio was not a fan of product placement and he showed his objection by deliberately covering the Sprite logo during a scene in Miyagi's workshop. They kept having to retake it over and over and over until they felt that you could see it just enough to make it what it is. Ralph Macchio sticking it to the man. Now, speaking of Mr. Miyagi's workshop, it never existed. The apartment building exterior was, and still is, a real residence, and the back parking lot is still exactly the same. However, there never was a workshop back there. The filmmakers actually covered one of the covered carport areas with a fake wall and door to create the exterior of Miyagi's workshop. Maybe setting that up was part of the chores they had Ralph Macchio do to prepare for the film. Some people have asked about this one, but in the beach scene when Mr. Miyagi and Daniel are walking back to the truck, they are harassed by two drunk men. One of these men is wearing a Washington Nationals baseball hat. But wait a minute, the Washington Nationals didn't come into existence until the Montreal Expos moved to DC in 2005. The real explanation is that while the Nationals did not yet exist in Washington, the Washington Senators did, and they have the same logo and hat. Otherwise, that would have been a really good guess. Ralph Macchio still owns a number of props and memorabilia from the set. This includes the championship trophy from the first film, the infamous blue and white bandana, which was a total improvisation by Pat Morita, by the way. He just happened to have it in his pocket, and during that scene when he's tending to Daniel, he just decided to pull it out and wrap it around his head. It was unscripted, and now it's an icon of the film. The most notable possession from the film has to be the beautiful yellow 1948 Ford that Miyagi gives him as a birthday present. That is the very same car that has appeared in Cobra Kai TV show. Now he wasn't the only one that got a souvenir. William Zapka still has their signature red Cobra jacket, so that's nice. Now, during the scene in which the skeletal Cobras beat Daniel to a pulp, there is one shot when Johnny kicks Daniel in the face. When they were filming the scene, however, someone was off their mark and William Zapka accidentally, full powered, really kicked Machio in the face and it injured him. I think maybe that was an illegal kick. In 
And finally, if you've watched this film an unhealthy amount of times like I have, then perhaps you might have noticed a small detail. Mr. Miyagi tells Daniel that karate is for defense only. Apparently in its masterful ways, he appears to have asserted this as a curse on Daniel. If you watch very closely, the only time Daniel ever lands a hit in the tournament in which is when he's being defensive. Every single time. At several points, Daniel attempts an offensive or an advancing move and he either misses or he's countered and takes a hit. Go ahead and watch it, you'll see. Every single one of the hits he lands is in defense or a counter to something thrown at him. If he's the one making the offensive move, he fails. And this includes the crane kick. If you watch, he was stationary and Johnny came to him. Now, is this a coincidence or incredibly clever planning by the filmmakers? It actually makes sense too. I mean, he's a novice and he hasn't trained very long, so it does make sense that he would telegraph and not be good enough yet to land any offensive moves. Even more interesting though is, this also seems to hold true in the final fights of both the second and third movie. Hmm. And for honorable mention and for fun, I'd like to point out a few of my favorite revealing mistakes. The first is the visible smoke machine. In the scene when Daniel is running from the Cobras through the foggy field, right as he's about to reach the fence, you can see the source of the fog pumping away discreetly in the grass. Also, Johnny's headband appears to be magic. During his fight with Daniel in the tournament, he kicks up from the ground and if you look closely enough, you see the headband fly off his head and onto the floor and Pat Johnson even bends down to pick it up and tosses it to the side. Yet in the very next shot, it's magically back on his head. And even though Pat Johnson was the choreographer of the film, that didn't stop Ralph Macho from wanting to help. Now, once I show you this, you can't unsee it ever again. Right before the moment where Johnny drops that vicious elbow into Daniel's knee, you can see Ralph Macchio actually gesture to the knee as if William Zappa would forget his line. I guess you can say he literally asked for it. So that's all for this episode. I could go on and on and on all day on this one, but I was told I had to limit it to 10. Anyway, I would love to revisit this one again later and please comment below with any more trivia you can share about the film. I'm also taking suggestions on other movies. Any martial arts movie that you'd like to see, list them all below. Thanks everyone. Like, subscribe, you know the drill, and we'll see you next time. You guys are the best around. I'll see myself out. <laughs>